it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Rob Templeman. Uh, Rob is the Chief Engineer for Cybersecurity at Crane, and he's also our point of contact along with uh, Craig Jackson at CACR for the CACR Crane Collaboration in Cybersecurity. So it's, it's really a pleasure to have him here today. He, for some of you may know him from his time here at IU, where he got his PhD. And then before that, he also has degrees from Rose Holman and Purdue University. And he's gonna be talking today about building a new cyber secure Navy. So with that, would you please uh, help me in welcoming Rob? Thank you so much for the introduction, Bob. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today. I have long loved this, this talk series. I think I've been attending for on the order of seven years now. So I've, I've seen quite a bit and I've consumed a lot of great information from this. I've also consumed a lot of pizza, especially when I was there. So I, uh, I, one thing I adopted especially quickly was the skill to find free food on campus. And this is one of the best. It, it's a bonus that you get great material as well. And so, uh, so Vaughn invited me to come speak and I felt that it was, it was probably a good thing and I owed it to the center. So I'm very excited to speak today about cyber and challenges. And so first I, I want to throw out there that I think it's fair to say that cybersecurity in any environment is challenging. I don't in any way want to say that what we're doing is hard and it's easy for everyone else. I also want to throw out a caveat that I'm not going to be talking about our enterprise environment, you know, what's done to secure this laptop and our enterprise IT, our server and our websites of this sort. I'm going to talk about something a little different. And I think what is uh, probably, probably the more interesting part of what we do so with that, I'd like to understand the composition of the audience a little bit. First, who here has served, or I'll say who's served in the, the Navy or the Marine Corps? We have one, excellent. Which one? Marine Corps. Hoorah, right. very happy to hear that. So uh, so continue to speak up and support the Marine Corps if you want to. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you didn't know, you'll soon learn that Bloomington really is a Navy town. There's a, there's a great presence here, and I'll speak to some of that over here. So with that, let's, uh, oh, one more warning, just a warning for you. Now, all the rumors about acronym use in the Department of Defense are, are true, and it's actually a lot worse than you probably hear about. And so I'm trying, I'm gonna be on my best behavior today. I'll try to eliminate the use of acronyms. Um, when, I, when I have to use them, I'll try to explain them. Please call me on it. Uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand if you have a question about something that I said. So, and if you can't hear me in the back, please, please speak up, I'll do my best. So this is our challenging environment. And for our, for our operational Navy, this is what daily life looks like. The official mission of the Navy is to maintain, train, and equip combat-ready forces capable of winning wars, deterring aggression, and maintaining security of the seas. To express the, the magnitude of our mission, of our operation, we have 600,000 sailors and Marines, and we operate over nearly 300 ships and submarines. In terms of aircraft, the Navy has an enormous aircraft footprint in terms of both fixed wing and rotary wing helicopters um, to the order of 3,700 different airframes. That doesn't even count all the unmanned airframes. Though. And we operate in any corner of the globe. So in any context, day-to-day -day environments are challenging. Even a simple evolution, like going to the rifle range, you know, and, and engaging in some sort of target practice. And these photos express sort of what we do. On the top left, the photos taken on the aircraft carrier or at sea, we basically have a mobile airport. So on, uh, on a deck less than five acres in size, there'll be nearly 70, 75 aircraft where even in dangerous sea states, they're launching and recovering these, these aircraft and performing operations. On the top right, you can see the launch of a, a Trident II missile from a submerged submarine. This is really a, a key component of our nation's nuclear deterrent. And this is, again, something that in any, any condition is a, a dangerous evolution. On the bottom left, uh, we see a lot about the Navy SEALs in different movies. Much of that's pretty true. Uh, what you see in those, those films reflects the, the types of missions that they undergo. And you can see, even in an environment like this, there's, there's a lot going on. In the bottom right, call out to the Marine Corps. So the, the Marine Corps is really a maritime force. You know that you operate in land 
And here you can see that they're uh, fast roping up the helicopter onto a commercial ship at sea. So in any environment, these are going to be challenging situations. There's a lot of safety issues. When you look at the entanglement of cybersecurity, it becomes much more difficult. Because like everything else in your world, what you don't see are the different computation pieces of hardware that enable us to do what we do. And so today's talk is really going to focus on the cybersecurity behind all of this. So first, so this is going to be the outline for the talk here. I need to, to first talk a little bit about Crane, because I, I um, expect I need to explain what we do just a little bit. And then before we can talk about cyber and what we do at Crane in that regard, I need to talk some about engineering and acquisition. And so with that, let's just jump into this here. So first, by a show of hands, who, before the talk announcement, didn't know what Crane was and heard of Crane? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what we expect. Um, who feels like you really understand what Crane does? Okay, that's about what I expect. So, so we'll talk about that. Um, I, I, I express the size of our Navy in terms of ships and submarines. I, I think it's pretty obvious that um, you can't, Amazon sells anything anymore, but you still can't buy something. And, and you know, you can't buy a helicopter very conveniently. Much of what we require to enable our mission is developed in-house. And as such, we have really a, a pretty enormous research and development environment. And so this is a, a chart that reflects Navy research and development establishment, establishment, which is the formal arm of the Navy that's responsible for discovering, developing, and transitioning technologies to enable our different war fighting capabilities. And the way it breaks down is that there are 20 different commands, about 20 different commands, that are distributed across the country that perform different functions for the Navy. And each of these has a high concentration of scientists and engineers that perform everything from basic science and, and technology research to actually designing and building the platforms that we use. And if you look at this, if you look at this map, you'll see that something is a little obvious and that most of these Navy bases are near bodies of water. You know, there's a huge concentration on the East Coast and West Coast, and then there's Indiana. And so that's where we live right there. And believe it or not, this, this little dot on the map um, shows where the third largest naval base in the world is. So NSWC Crane is about 30 miles away and takes a space of about 100 square miles. So in terms of what we do, this is a quick infographic, which I'll explain a little bit. Um, high level, top line, we have 3,300 government employees. Most of them are technical. We have 1,500 scientists and engineers. In terms of our business base, we do about $1.3 billion in work each year. And we have one mission, and that's harnessing the power of technology for the warfighter. And we do that for three different focus areas. The first is electronic warfare, which at the first order you can think of jamming radars and communications. Strategic missions, um, that's uh, largely supporting the, uh, the uh, Ohio-class submarines within the Navy, and then expeditionary warfare. So that's supporting our, our Navy SEAL and Marine Corps customers. Any questions so far on this? Okay. Really what Crane's about is systems engineering. Very engineering heavy organization. And I know that IU now has an engineering program. In 2020, you're gonna have your first graduates, but it's not uh, heavy yet in engineering. So by a quick show of hands, where are all the engineers at that don't work at Crane? So we have a couple, excellent. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about engineering because uh, so engineering weighs heavily in what we do with cybersecurity. Also throw out there that the DOD has about 108,000 engineers, very um, heavy engineering overall. Oftentimes when you think of the Department of Defense, you think about the uniformed forces. So there's a lot of research and development that goes on. So we also know there's a lot of misconceptions about engineering. Any engineer will tell you that. They ask about what you do and uh, it, I'll let the four-year-old think I drive trains, but, but there's a lot of misconceptions that are a bit frustrating. And so what do we do when we don't know something? We go to Google, right, and, and ask you know, you know, for information. And they're usually pretty good. So if you go to Google and, and look at the word soldier, it's going to return this. And if there's any soldiers in the room, you could, you could say it's probably pretty accurate. Now, it's not too bad. They did OK. But if you do the same for engineers or engineering, <laughs> you get like Bob the Builder. Pretty much. You, know, you, get, you have you know, 
really a bunch of white guys and mostly yellow hard hats holding a drum, which is just completely inaccurate. So I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about what engineering is and how we get the systems that we use. So if you go, so maybe Merriam-Webster can do better than Google. So we go there and this is the definition. And, and I'll just jump to it's the application of science and engineering to do useful things. That, that's really the essence of engineering. It works very closely with science. So if you, uh, if you aren't an engineer, this is just a one, one slide sheet that will, that will give you the basics. If you, if you look at this cartoon here, this is the engineering process. You have some problem. You need to perform, perform some function or you need to um, uh, you otherwise have a need, a requirement. And what you do from there is you basically come up with some sort of plan. You design something. And once you have a design, you fabricate it. You make a physical instantiation of it or some other um, useful form. And then you test it. And so from there, you reflect to see whether what you produced is going to solve your original problem. And most often, it doesn't completely work. And so you iterate. So it's a very iterative process at a first order. This is really what engineering is about. It's really pretty intuitive. Probably the more important thing to express is that engineers really live in trade spaces. And so, you know, in this trade space, you have these, these different functions where you, you have to, you know, by increasing one attribute, you can compare the other. And at the first order, we deal with cost schedule performance. And very rarely we have the benefit of being able to be where we want to be with all three. Oftentimes, you're going to have a, a constrained cost environment, and that's really, that's really going to drive how much time you have to, to go through this process and what the end result looks like. Any questions so far here? So to make an engineer, go to engineering school. Engineering school is a great pumping out engineers. And if you didn't know, there's, a, there's a standards that exist for engineering education, and this is the organization that, that does that. The engineering Accreditation Commission develop standards for uh, an accredited engineering program. And you'll see, as you expect, that there's a, a significant amount of math and science coursework, some engineering coursework, which is really just learning how to apply that math and science um, knowledge. And really, the key thing, what kind of makes you an engineer before you leave, is you engage in this literal major design experience. It's a capstone exercise. And so this is one of the best I've seen. So, so my capstone exercise for my undergrad was designing a little amplifier. You know, it, I learned a lot, but it wasn't as cool as this. And so this is Columbia University. And this team, their major design experience was building this automatic bartending luxury experience thing. And so, you know, this team of four very happy guys, you know, designed this cool looking machine that dispenses drinks automatically. And so the big takeaway here is that their definition, this definition of a major design experience is a team of four soon-to-be engineers working over one semester with a $700 budget. So you, you create this cool machine, hopefully they get to keep it, and then they go off into the workforce. And then they have a major design experience. And so this is um, one of our latest ships. And so this just went out to the ocean this summer. Mm -hmm. This is the USS Gerald Ford. Big aircraft carrier, you can see. And so, in, in terms of what it took to create this this ship and to deploy it, it took thousands of engineers over 16 years, and at a cost of about 13 billion dollars. And the problem is, is they don't really teach you how to in engineering school how to scale these things. Even the best systems engineering programs aren't really equipped to do this sort of thing. So, how do you do it? <clears throat> well. It's the government, of course, there's paperwork and standards. And so enter uh, what we call DOD 5000. That's the standard for it. And so it's basically in a, a collection of standards, but there's a lot to it. And it basically calls out for a complex system, how you start with a need and end up with a capability that you can actually use. And so I just basically want to highlight a couple things here. We get some sort of need, some sort of requirement from someone within our organization, and they want the capability. And so this part here is that engineering process. From the need, you're going to generate some set of requirements. You're going to try to get precise definitions for the, uh, the, the attributes of the solution that will satisfy that operational need. 
once you understand all the requirements, how big it's going to be, how fast it's going to go, um, you know, uh, whether or not it has a television on or not, you can think of anything. From there, you're going to do what we call synthesize those requirements. You're going to make that design. That's where you end up with drawings and blueprints and, and code. From there, when you have your design, you'll fabricate it and you'll have some instantiation of it, some prototype. And there you come to validating that solution. And you can see cutting across this, this V, that's where you ensure that the solution meets those requirements. Once you have a validated solution, you can deliver it. So this is probably one of the most important concepts within DOD in terms of making sure that our customers have the right products that they need. So in looking back at that, the probably the most critical piece where most programs have issues is within the definition of those requirements. If you don't get the requirements right, the, the, the system's quickly going to diverge from what the customer wants and it's going to go downhill from there. And so I'm just going to throw out there that requirements need to be unambiguous and clear. They need to be testable. And when you have a set of requirements, they need to be consistent. You can't say that the, uh, the ship has to be more than 500 feet long while being less than 500 feet long. That's a, that's a simple one there. And so I'll come back to this later. So it, 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 I don't expect it to make sense quite yet while I'm talking about requirements and the system engineering process. So now we're 20 minutes into it and we can mention cyber. First, we need to talk about, excuse me, about what cyber is, right? Because everyone has a different definition and it's this, it can be a nebulous concept. Around 2014, I think that's when cyber CSI was briefly aired. And, you know, I've been working in this field for some time and my mom asked me, what, what is a cyber, you know? And um, I just thought that was kind of a funny question, but it was a good question because it's really kind of hard to define that. And so let's go back to Google, right? Because, you know, maybe they can do better. They got the soldier thing right, failed on engineering. What do they think cyber looks like? So here, <laughs> we can see that cyber is blue and sometimes green. And there's usually globes and hoodies, locks and skulls, right? And so I think that's even worse than the Bob Builder engineering thing. So, so let's talk about cyber in a more general sense. But before we go there, let's talk about the sobering nature of it, right? And I'll start with Dan Gear. He's one of my favorites. He spoke at IU recently. He is one of the most eloquent people I know within the cybersecurity domain. And he has this, he was a, I think he gave a black hat address, and he said that there are three professions that beat their practitioners into a state of humility. Farming, weather forecasting, and cybersecurity. He was on to say that he, he engages in two out of the three, so he must be, um, must take up a lot of beatings. Um, me, I'm a pretty uh, primitive knuckle dragon marine, so I like funny photos. And this is this is my expression of the, the state of cybersecurity. Um, my sister-in-law, who I love, gave me this photo. She lives in this neighborhood in town with these kids that are usually up to no good. And for some period of time, they thought it was funny to find roadkill and put get well balloons on. <laughs> yeah, my sister-in-law, true photo, taken on the west side of Bloomington. But I think that it really accurately reflects what we see in cybersecurity, right? Systems get owned, there are these breaches, damage has been done, you're not gonna go back to your original state. And then they, they say, okay, we're gonna get credit monitoring a whole year, maybe two whole years of credit monitoring, hopefully things will get well. So it's really tough. And we, we really feel the pain in the Navy as well. And there's actually, you know, we do a lot of things that aren't public, but, um, there was a, a very public 2014 Navy cyber awakening. And without going into details, the chief of naval operations was quoted as saying that there is a new risk calculus in cyber. And so this was something that um, got a lot of face time for Admiral Moore, the head of the NSA and US Cyber Command, and, uh, and it, it just increased efforts overall. And this has been very vis visible. You probably noticed this on the academic side as well. So in 2013, there was a Defense Science Board report on resilient military systems and the advanced cyber threat. And it's, it's a good report. I encourage you to read at least the front of it because I think the, uh, the information in it applies to anyone in the community. 
Um, but one thing it introduces is this cyber threat taxonomy, which is which is really useful. And what they say is that um, it's obvious that not all threat actors are the same. Not all attackers are the same. There's different levels of capabilities, and at each capability level, there's a, a different number of these actors. And so they see this, this, this stratification, if you will, of six different levels of threat actors. And we'll start at the base. And so we have this you know, wide triangle expressing the, you know, the, the many script kitties that we have out there. And what they do is they simply exploit pre-existing known vulnerabilities. Vulnerability. So they use Kali or Metasploit or some other framework or just you know reusing some binary they find online to, to do criminal or otherwise bad things. At the next level, fewer number of them, we have actors that can discover unknown vulnerabilities. And so some of this work isn't nefarious. A lot of great work comes out of academia to highlight concerns that we need to address, but there are, uh, there are actors out there that are doing it for bad. And at this level, we're looking at some actors that um, invest on the order of millions of dollars to, to understand these capabilities. You see evidence of this uh, at some degree when you hear about the zero day market that, that is in existence. At the top level, what they call levels five and six, you have the most sophisticated actors and they can actually create vulnerabilities. They're the ones that can actually put a hardware Trojan into your laptop. They can, um, uh, do the things that you hear that are conceptualized. We don't see a lot of this um, in the news. Looking at this, you'll see this axis over here. And at the very bottom level, you have actors that are just a nuisance. You know, they might just slow down a network service or, or you know, DDoS, you know, CNN, when you're seeking to find out what the latest news is. But at the highest level, they're expressing that the most sophisticated actors are capable of, uh, existential hype attacks. And so the, the, the plain language for that is existential is often spoke of in terms of nuclear weapons. And so the, what this report says is that it's, um, it's possible, they're not saying it's likely, that a existential type cyber attack can be launched at our nation. And so people speak of uh, cyber Pearl Harbors and such, this, this could be worse than that. And so I'm not here to spread FUD by any stretch, but I'm just I'm saying that this report's pretty useful. Long report, but their conclusion is that we can't possibly defend all Department of Defense systems from those most motivated actors. The, the report's conclusion is that we have to select some small subset of the most critical systems and protect them from those most advanced threats. A lot of them will be exploitable if this sort of actor decides to go after us. Specifically, what they say is that the, the only good way to prevent this existential type of a attack is to have a credible nuclear deterrent, is to have uh, credible, credible weapon systems to act as a deterrent, and we have to absolutely secure those. So th that's the DSB report. Are there any questions on that? Um, in order to have a deterrent, does it take attribution that should be a I mean, is the attribution of attacks getting good enough that it, we can, like, it's less than it used to be? The, so attribution is absolutely hard. So if you had a, if you had an attack of this scale and you couldn't attribute, yeah, you're, you're, you're pretty much hosed. But the report specifically calls out to only three nations that are at that top level. And so if you see that sort of attack that required billions of dollars and, you know, years of effort to do that, you would assume that um, you, you wouldn't be surprised about who it came. Does the report assume that <clears throat> tier one, two, three actors can't because maybe defenses are are not in place achieve the same kind of effects? <clears throat> Does it assume that you need a tier five or six actor to produce an existential event? That That's difficult to answer because you can look at it in terms of classifying the actor in terms of just how much money they put into it or classifying the actor in terms of the magnitude of their effect. And so if you, if you, so I guess it is possible. I, I, mean, I don't right. really say, but yeah, I, I guess if there's a possibility that you can have a very small budget, find something that can um, have this sort of existential threat, that would be really bad. It's the, the report's scary enough on the surface. So I, <laughs> I didn't delve too much into those hypotheticals. Okay, so when you're talking about 
the situation, the threat landscape, um, being a warfighting organization, we oftentimes think of you know, land combat and terrain, you know, cyber terrain. So if you have to defend a system, what is that cyber terrain? And, and this provides uh, a great lesson, if you will. And so who's familiar with two scenes before? <laughs> Most of you, okay. So the cyber imaginal lines are very common. Just the whole takeaway there is that in the interwar period between World, World War, Wars I and II, um, France anticipated that there would be future conflict with Germany and that this entire border was something to be concerned about. And they made an assumption that Germany would not come through this region of their border, that it would be too difficult, and, uh, and that they would come here. So they made a decision to throw enormous defenses, enormous static defenses on this line. And history showed that that, that was completely wrong. And we see the same thing in cyber. And so this chart, this graphic right here, is something that I borrowed from Ed Talbot at San Diego National Lab. It was a, an IEEE paper that he published. And basically, he asserts, and, and I agree with the assertion, that most organizations have a very limited view of cybersecurity. Specifically, most organizations focus on software and networks. You know, you're looking at operate, operating systems and applications. It's changing, but it's, it's, it's still largely true. And he claims that full-scope cybersecurity is necessary for most organizations. And he uses this, uh, this abstraction of a computation stack. So if you're familiar with the, the, uh, the OSI model or, or a, the networking stack, this is more generalized to computation. And so I'll unpack this just a little bit. But, but just know that any computation device, whether it is a, a small embedded system like your Nest thermostat or your smartphone, your laptop, or our fighter jets, you're going to have many instantiations of this. So starting at the very bottom of the computation stack, is your bulk semiconductor material. You know, it's just silk and it's, it's you know, pure sand, if you will. And from there, we built transistors. And there, from the you know, next level up, we've integrated circuits, your memories and CPUs and such. And then we, we have these printed circuit boards and we assemble hardware systems and we start seeing flavors of software. We put firmware on top and then you have your operating system. I, I don't have to go into too much detail. Um, just know that when you have the system and you start putting users on it, you have some interesting dynamics. And so that's part of this, this computation stack as well. And at the very top, as we see it, we have policy. Because policy, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, affects everything. And, and your policy can also become a vector for you. So let's focus on these three different regions of the stack and unpack them just a little bit. This one will be easy. I don't think I have to convince you at all that there's a lot of attacks that happen over our networks. And so, uh, you know, and many of us affect us government employees and you heard about these. And so the Anthem breach, the OPM breach, the, the huge Equifax breach, Ashley Madison, it's, it's, there's too much to contain on this one slide. Um, it's bad and I think it means we pretty much get credit monitoring for life. But um, this protecting a system from these threats is not quite enough. So let's go above that. So I think we all know um, about the work that's done in social engineering. The uh, social engineering is one of the most popular things um, at hacker cons. We, some of us might have been victims of ransomware. And so we know how bad that threat is. And to, uh, to a motivating example for the threat to policy, this is an actual graphic that reflects the policy that you have to go to to turn on uh, a Navy network. And so this is public facing, but you can see that there are all kinds of, you know, even congressional. And that's only the cyber policy, right? This is just, there are, there, there are some things on the surface don't say cyber, right. but they touch. This is not policy. all the policy, this is the cyber related policy. Yes, yes. And so there's really no hope of, uh, of, of understanding all of this. And so this can be a vector for us. So let's go down to the bottom of the stack. And I suspect that this might require the most explanation. So now we're going to talk about hardware. So what we find is that as you harden the computation stack in regions, obviously you have to plug leaks in other spots. The adversaries are going to pivot because they, they, they want to continue access to these machines. They want to continue these effects. And so if you secure that middle, they move up and they move down. And we 
I think as a community got a little scared last week with the specter and the meltdown news. So let's talk about um, what else can happen when you're looking at hardware. So let's let's go here first. Um, 2000, I believe it was 2016 IEEE S&P paper. It won best paper. It was called A2. Um, it was an analog hardware Trojan trigger piece of work. And to explain what's going on here, who's familiar with semiconductor design? Excellent, excellent. So um, what we have here is a what we call a fabrication time attack, a fabrication time hardware trojan. And if you don't know, when you create a CPU or you create memory, you do it much as you do it with software. You have a, a language, right? So what you do is you express your hardware design through a programming language. And at that point, you have something that looks a lot like source code. But instead of running it through a compiler, you run it through a tool that's going to create artwork. It's going to create the, the physical structures that become hardware. And once you have that, and it, it literally is called artwork or photo masks, you go to what we call a fabrication facility, which makes those semiconductors. Well, we all know because of Moore's law that uh, devices are becoming smaller, more power efficient, and cheaper. And what's happening is it's becoming extremely expensive and difficult to fabricate integrated circuits at these advanced technology nodes. And so we're seeing devices that have feature sizes of less than 10 nanometers. And it's, it's becoming such that the integrated circuit uh, manufacturing base is really consolidated. And so most companies now that claim to manufacture hardware are in fact performing that software aspect of it. You know, they're coding up their hardware designs and then they send that design off for fabrication and then they get hardware back. And so you, you probably notice the, the, the probably see the concern right there. It would be much like if you were a software developer and you didn't have access to the compiler and you had no way of validating that your source code was um, related to the binary that you got back. There, there are many opportunities for um, adversaries to do interesting things. And so what this works, that was a long explanation to say that when you have your hardware design and you go off and get it manufactured, you have to trust that your, your fabricator isn't doing anything to change it, that they're not adding anything, that they're not removing anything or otherwise modifying it. And what this work did is they added what amounts to two capacitors, two analog capacitors within empty space of a semiconductor to add a hardware Trojan. And so this was a Trojan that can be triggered by simply visiting a certain website. And so their, their concept of operations is that a device, hardware that's been compromised like this can be triggered by simply going to a website. And so because of the feature size here, these are the dimensions of their trigger. So this is flu season, this is an appropriate example we all know how small the, the, the flu particles are, and you can stack just eight across in the space. So extremely small scales here. And so when you're talking about a device that potentially has 20, 40 billion transistors, and you have this small bad element in there, it becomes nearly impossible to find. So I spent too much time on that probably. Let's go even further down. So if that's not bad enough, you can actually attack down at the atomic level. And so silicon, on its on its own um, doesn't provide much value. You have to do what's called doping. You have to um, modify the electrical electrical properties by adding other electrical elements. And so we have seen work of these open source uh, dopant attacks where you can change the behavior of a transistor by changing the, the chemistry of it. And so then it becomes nearly impossible, you know, given the device to see if the dopants have been changed. And so if, for a grounded example, consider that, you know, a transistor can be thought of as a switch. It's, you know, a zero or a one. But if you change those dopants, maybe it's more likely to become a one than a zero. So you can, you can really do some interesting things there. So I think I've talked about the challenges, some of the threats that we're concerned about. Now I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're actually doing to make a difference to try to protect ourselves. And so what I really want to emphasize here is that we work closely with the academic community. We love the basic research that's coming out, and we're very motivated to turn them into solutions as quickly as possible. And here I'm going to talk about work that we're doing 
um, at three different regions of the computation stack where we have ties to Indiana University. So first, we're going to talk about securing hardware. And let's start with this graphic. So if you're going to attack hardware, it's going to fall into this class of uh, a supply chain attack. And traditionally, when you talk about the supply chain, you're looking at quality and reliability, maybe just continuity of being able to buy what you need to buy. But when we're talking about cyber, we add some other concerns here. And so two that I'll throw in there, um, the first is fraudulent product, which is counterfeit material. And the second is malicious insertion. That is the adding and removing functionality, hardware uh, trojans, if you will. And so just let's camp on and counterfeits um, for a little bit, because I think a lot of folks don't really recognize how much of a problem counterfeit electronics are. So this is part of the problem, and, and this affects a lot of us. We have been conditioned to buy lots of electronics and to, to keep them for these short periods, and then they go away. We throw them away or recycle them, and then we don't think about them any longer. And what happens is, is all of our all of our electronics aren't used anymore. I'll say most of our electronics aren't used anymore, are put on barges and go overseas where they're recycled. And so you would think that they're just disposed of in an environmentally safe way. But in reality, what happens is uh, a lot of those parts are harvested and resold. And so um, when you look at some of these parts, some of them are extremely valuable. And some of them can be made more value, more valuable by uh, modifying them or tampering them in such a way to make them look like a different part. And so this is an enormous problem. And in 2011, there was testimony uh, at the Senate on this, and they, they quantified it, saying that as many as 15% of our parts within DOD are counterfeit. And it costs our industry on the order of $7 billion per year. So it's really an enormous problem. The problem is there are means to inspect these devices to see if they're genuine or not, but it's hard to do that at scale. If you're given 10 parts and, and told to determine whether they're genuine or counterfeit, you can reasonably do that. But when you have a real 1,000 parts or 10,000 parts, inspecting each and every one becomes nearly impossible. And so what's done in practice, there are standards for this. You perform some sort of sampling function and you inspect those. And so using statistical measures, you, you try to gain some confidence that a whole lot of parts is good. But we know that not even that is good enough. And so we're seeing the emergence of equipment that's coming out that allows you to do 100% inspection, but really the utility is in the collection of imagery. The inspection piece, the computational inspection piece is really lacking because what these systems require is an exemplar. It requires you know, a known good part from which it just compares everything else. But sometimes it's hard finding a known good part for a given lot. And secondly, these systems often um, don't do well in the presence of expected variation in these devices. You know, just even different serial numbers or, or, um, or, or, or minor quality differences. So we have been working with Indiana University on this project. Specifically, we're in the middle of a three-year contract with IU to the Naval Engineering Education Consortium, where Professor David Crandall is a lead. And we're looking at using computer vision coupled with equipment like this to do a better job at finding counterfeit equipment. So we hear a lot about deep learning, and, and there's some perception that deep learning will fix everything. And in some cases, it actually works. And this is a, this is a really interesting example, because here, we simply looked to some existing work and used it in an unintended way and got a, an interesting result. And so this was published at a top computer vision conference in 2013. And what it is, is, is it's just a large neural network. It's a deep neural network. And the, the way it was designed is it's um, intended for video. And so it takes two images, most likely adjacent frames in a video. It runs it through the network, and it tells you um, where motion has occurred, where optical flow has occurred. So it's useful for, find, for finding differences from frame to frame in images. We used it in such a way that we use it to ingest images of two different microelectronic parts to find what those differences are. And so doing that, it allows you to see whether to what degree parts are really the same or really different. And we, we built a system around this and to evaluate it, 
we took uh, basically a lot, a bag of 100 different parts, and we imaged them and fed them to this algorithm. And you can see that this plot here, there's each element in this plot is the comparison of two parts. And there's symmetry about here. And this is a heat map so that if the image is blue, it is um, dark blue. It's absolutely the same. And if it's red, they're completely different. And so obviously this line is, is um, comparing a part to itself. But if you just look at it, you can see these three clusters. I hope you can see it in the back of the room, these three regions of blue. And so if you're familiar with machine learning, this is an unsupervised technique. So this has no a priori knowledge of what these parts should look like. It hasn't been uh, trained on any labeled data, but just throwing the parts at the algorithm, it can find where the similar parts are. If you give it an image set that has the same type of part, but the presence of both genuine and counterfeit, it works equally well. And so we've gotten uh, really good results on this. It's been very interesting work, and we just published it at AIPR, which is uh, one of the uh, computer vision workshops. Are you just looking at the outside, or did you do that because you know you're actually for this, we're looking at the outside, but um, you can potentially decap. You can use X-ray. So X-ray, um, so that last machine I showed you, that creative electron machine, is an X-ray machine that's non-destructive. And so um, really kind of the holy grail is that we can do this sort of effort non-destructively. And so just using visual inspection or some other uh, non-destructive imaging technique. Any other questions on the slide? But then in, in practical tools, this kind of testing should be undertaken with parts before they have been assembled into devices. Because after all, if uh, um, let's say your company is purchasing all the laptops and you want to check whether all the component, component parts are there genuine, what would, would you have to do with a simple field check? Yeah, so this image set was generated by IU, and, and most of these parts were parts that were already on the finished board assembly. In practice, we'd be dealing with bare parts. So in practice, kind of what we're looking at for our customers is we have some sort of design and you know we're building a circuit card. And when the bare parts come in, oftentimes they come in on a big reel or trays of parts, we're going to have to make an assessment whether to accept those and take them to the next step of manufacturing. Great question. So we've talked about what we're doing with hardware. Let's move up to the very top of the computation computation stack here with Newware. And I, I'll, I'll caveat this saying that I have not been personally involved with this work directly. One of our employees, Dr. Tim Kelly, is in the back of the room. This is his work that he's largely done with Indiana University. And so I will do my best to get through this. I'll look at him for, for cues that I'm completely off base. Um, please, if you have any questions, I'm going to rely on Tim to help answer those. But before I go into this, I just want to say that this notion of um, behavioral cyber science is one of the four top cyber priorities for the Department of Defense. And so this was um, just recently announced. And this is work that Indiana University has been thrown up for a couple of years now. So, so we're in a really good place. And the core idea here is that security can't be separated from social and ecological environments. And the problem that we face is that the, the efforts that we make in security often exacerbate our cognitive limitations rather than taking advantage, taking advantage of the strengths that we have in cognition and heuristic thinking. And so this image here is Tim's, and it represents our methodology that we use to examine the nature of this problem. And so human subjects can provide insight at a low level, but not the lowest level, of how individuals behave. And then you can scale that dimension. When you start grouping people together and you have um, you know, larger groups, the dynamics are going to be a little bit different. And then the interaction between individuals or between groups also has interesting effects. And then we use cognitive models to represent the actions of, of individuals in small groups. So this is a, a big research space, very highly underexplored. And, and that expresses that's that's. Evidence of that is the interest by DOD, and, uh, and, and we'd love to talk to more folks about doing this type of work. So when we talk about users hurting our systems, I think most CISOs, most practitioners that are in industry are going to say that phishing is our greatest concern. You know, we know this is a real threat. 
um, we know the degree to which ransomware is hurting us. And this is, you know, this is a probably a nice, precise academic definition of what phishing is that came from the Global Anti-Phishing Working Group. But I, I think it's pretty easy to understand that we get these emails and we see them all the time. And if we make a bad decision, there are, there are some dire consequences. Um, the the anti-phishing working group has some interesting data to back up how big of a problem it is. And so they show that the, uh, the uh, infection, the lowest infection rate is Sweden, but the, uh, the highest infection rate is in China at 47%. So that's really an enormous fraction. And no one can really escape the harm that comes from it. This has been public within the government. The IRS paid almost $6 billion in fraudulent tax returns based on identity theft. So to combat that problem, we oftentimes go to what are convenient technical means. And so we can filter email, we can deactivate hyperlinks in our email and do what we can to prevent drive-by downloads. But really where we, where, where we need to improve is in user literacy and training. And I, I would guess that just about everyone here has probably been forced to undergo some sort of phishing training, right? And uh, I think everyone has some degree of it. And we know that it doesn't work all that well. And, and when it is good, we don't really have a way of quantifying or measuring how well it actually worked. And so we look towards ways of measuring these educational outcomes, towards you know, baselining the performance of people before they take this training and see what improvement we can see when we, we put them through the training. And so this has been work that has been led by Tim here. And what he recently published is a uh, the results of an experiment that you put together. And what it is, is it's a two alternative forced choice experiment to evaluate the effects of security indicators on decision makers. And so he had a task and basically users were presented with legitimate websites or spoof websites, and they had to make a decision. They had to either log into that given website or back out. And so to, to run this experiment, they turned to Mechanical Turk and they had a pretty large pool. And the procedure was that each participant was, I believe, given the survey ahead of time. So they were, they were given the survey to well, the understand. Survey was actually afterwards, so it didn't bias. I'm sorry. Okay, so the survey was afterwards. So they, so they went through the experiment and they were presented with six websites, spoofed or not spoofed, and they made these decisions and their performance was recorded. Along with that, their mouse tracking data was captured. After the experiment, they, uh, they participated in surveys to capture the demographic information, but also their, their professed level of security competency. And so we, we had a bunch of surveys that they self-reported, but then we also asked them specific knowledge questions and graded them on their knowledge. So we had a self-reported uh, security level versus their ability to actually identify certain key information security terms. Okay. So, so they ran this experiment and they used regression techniques to identify the importance of, of various pieces of information within the browser and to show you exactly what they'd be what they'd be seeing. So looking at these two different internet browsers here, you can see that the only difference is the wording of the site. So if you if you see this logo you expect that you are on eBay, the site you would hope to be to buy all of your fun <laughs> stuff. But in reality, this has been, been spoofed. It's yeah. in, it's in, and at the time we ran the experiment, ebuy.com was an available do domain. It's no longer open for purchase, but- um, You bought it? No, we did not. <laughs> we, we, we got funding, so we didn't have to turn to fishing to generate money. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so they got some interesting results, and they found that the uh, the presence of the security indicators results in less mouse search on the website. And do you want to? It's actually pretty complicated. Okay. So we find it, so we find that the mouse measures are only useful for people who scored very highly on their knowledge tests. So they are the ones who are aware of the security indicators and the effects of the behavior. Uh, but what's interesting is. Uh, when you are looking at partial encryption or a standard TLS certificate, there is a high correlation with accuracy for uncertain search patterns. So looking at the sample entropy, the, the high knowledge people are going all over the screen, 
and they're accurate. But as soon as the green lock shows up, their sample entropy drops to almost nothing, and they are just as inaccurate as our novice users. So they, that is their heuristic. If they see that green lock, and that triggers their, their response, and that's true for all of users. That green lock is an indicator of logging in more than any sort of decision making on behalf of the user. So really exciting work, and, and this work was just accepted yeah. to Frontiers of Psychology, and uh, earlier this year, Tim actually presented some of this work at the UN headquarters in Vienna at a meeting of the Global Anti-Fishing Working Group. And so, um, in front of the problem in some ways, have some interesting results already, and we're, we're investing quite a bit into doing more of this work. So now we, going back to that notion of that computation stack. Yes. And, and I know I, I, I know there is efforts at the Office of Naval Research to, to start investments in that area as well. And Nate works at the Office of Naval Research, if you don't know. So, <laughs> so within that, uh, the Naval Research and Development Establishment, ONR is one of those really enormous pots of money there. So I would call it enormous. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have more. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we so we looked at the bottom of the computation stack and described a method that we used to secure systems. We, we went to the top of the computation stack. Now let's look at that entirety of the stack. Let's look at, at an entire system and reason over how we might secure something. So um, I told you I would do my best to minimize acronyms. Well, this is a page I think I'm going to throw all of them at you. And I'm really not going to explain any of them, but it's not necessary. And I just wanted to, to, to say that we have been doing um, cybersecurity in some degree as long as we've had computation systems uh, within the Navy. And, and some of this you know, comes out and, and helps the, the general public. And historically, though, what we've done is we've used these different compliance-based regimes, different lists of controls to secure systems. And it... it at one point, it was the TCS SEC, and it went to DISCAP and DICAP. Today, to secure a DOD system, we largely look to this risk management framework, which is based on uh, collection of NIST standards. And so it's, um, it's, it's almost identical to what's used in the rest of the federal government with FISMA, which uh, CACR has done a lot of work in that regard. The problem is, while you can make yourselves um, reasonably secure with these approaches, they often devolve to a compliance regime. You oftentimes want to just basically get through this list of controls, and you just want to be compliant as quickly as possible. So this is a completely native graph. There's nothing, there's little real about it at all, but it kind of exp it kind of shows the problem that we're, we're facing here. So on this axis, you have the, the, the time and effort that you take to try to secure a system. And on the other axis, if you could measure security, if you could say that this security is some units more secure than some other system, um, we would try to graph that there. And what I'm trying to show is that when you, when you seek to make a system secure, sometimes you work at making a system secure. You, you, you buy some gadget or you perform some function or execute some policy, but you actually impair it. You actually make the system more vulnerable. And a piece of data that backs that up is I believe something that was released in 2013 is when Mudge was at DARPA, and he um, he publicly released that 28% of all DoD software vulnerabilities come from security software, and so things like antivirus and such, the, the you know it performs some security function, but the the net effect is bad for your system, and so we we oftentimes see this when the mindset is just to check a control. Um, you, you can't count on it actually improving the posture of your system. So going back to requirements, it comes to, to bad requirements. And so one of those controls and one of these NIST standards says you shall use all source intelligence analysis of suppliers and potential, of, yeah, suppliers and potential suppliers. And yes, <laughs> I mean, I, how do you really answer that? So there's definitely some ambiguity there and it's hard to test against something like that. So the problem is whole scores of controls that are hard to implement like this end up costing you a lot of money and time and don't really do much to, to secure you. So this slide comes from Craig Jackson here. We work together very closely on this. And, and he has a, um, a great take on what some of these issues are. We know that the, the existing compliance regimes are very expensive and time consuming. 
and they're distracting. As I said, you become very focused on just complying with the standards and not making yourself more secure, and it stifles innovation. So what we want, what we desire, is security such that when you, you, you make efforts to make the system more secure, it actually becomes more secure. We really don't want to accept that anything we do is going to make the system worse off. So it might be you know, an ideal thing, but I'll throw that out there. Um, being an electrical engineer, you might expect expected tons of equations. I have none of my own, own in this pitch. The only one I have is from a lawyer, and so he can take the blame for putting an equation in the pitch. But this is really good. And what we're interested in is evidence-based security. And so here we want to use security controls that are, are proven, that we have evidence that they work, that you don't have to reason over whether to use them or not, and apply them to the system. We want to couple that with situational awareness and technology that you have with invariant principles. And now I'll speak to that in the next slide. Taken together, we feel that this is going to be a path towards outcome-based security. So if you want to successfully operate in a contested cyber environment versus just being compliant with the standard, that this is going to be necessary. And what's core to this are the information security practice principles. And so this is a product of CACR. It's gotten a lot of press. It's a wonderful product. They've recently been accepted for publication in the Journal of Information Warfare. There's been an O'Reilly book published, great white paper on the website. And I love it because it, on the first order, allows you to understand the basics of security and to communicate security effectively with decision makers. But what I'm, what I'm really wanting to use it for is use it as a means to perform assessments on systems, to basically put systems on trial, if you will, using this as the lens to understand whether a system should be deployed or not. So with that, I know I'm running out of time. I'll close things up here. I, I hope I've convinced you that we operate in a challenging environment and that uh, it's necessary that we do better with respect to cybersecurity. And of all the things I talked about, one thing I'd like to, to stay with you is that this notion of full scope cybersecurity is necessary. And it was convenient that the, the Intel vulnerability came about last week. Maybe you'll, you'll start to look further down that computation stack. So I'm out of time here, and I want to close with some actual pictures of crane engineers in the field just to show you that not one looks like Bob the Builder. And so, <laughs> um, with that, I'll take questions. And I want to say that if you're interested in working with the Navy, if you're interested in employment, we want both. And Mr. Dave Acton, who's in the audience here, will raise his hand. He's our university liaison, and he's on our corporate firing team. And so he's, he's a good person to talk to if you're interested in going further. And I'll take as many questions as Vaughn will allow me to. Well, first, let, let's thank you for the talk, Rob. <laughs> Question. Yeah. All right. Yeah, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the correlation between what self-reporting of how experts there were security and the actual? We found that the self-reporting was not predictive at all. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess one of the most intriguing things you mentioned was uh, that uh, provision of this modification to mm -hmm. an integrated sort, presumably so that an execution of a certain sequence of instructions would trigger a change in behavior of the device, right? And you mentioned that such a change is possible to achieve merely by uh, the owner of the computer which contains the device going to a certain website. Did you mention one, one, one of those, where the owner of the computer going to a certain website don't know what device you're going to execute. I'm sorry, say that last part again. Did you mention, did you, did you forget to mention one before close? That is the owner of the laptop needs to go to a particular website, don't know what the particular executed on, and then execute it. So that the sequence of instruction would actually. So they, they, their proof of concept was on JavaScript on the website. So, um, so the idea was basically they knew how the JavaScript is well uh, interpreted in a particular web browser so that they to sure that execution of a particular sequence of JavaScript statements would, would actually result in a particular sequence of mm -hmm. instruction going to 
another concept of operation that they look at is, um, you know, a, a microcontroller that's used in a radar system. And uh, given some RF input mm -hmm. on the digital end, it would eventually end up in some sequence of um, assembly instructions. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's so there's several means, and, and it is a great paper. So Matt Hicks is really the one that was behind it. He was at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they went to a, a lot of work to ensure that it wouldn't trigger, and they didn't want to. And, um, it, it, and they actually, this was probably the most interesting thing, they actually produced silicon. And so they had, they did a multi-wafer run, and uh, then they actually um, got this for hard out of this to validate the results. Let me ask you a question. You had a, a great piece at the beginning of your talk talking about engineering and scale, right? With that great transition from from college to a uh, you know aircraft career. I'm a little bit curious. I'm, I'm afraid I know the answer to this question, but in terms of cybersecurity as an engineering discipline, how do you see us doing in terms of scaling, and maybe particularly vis-a-vis -vis how well do you see the attackers doing in terms of scaling? I think it's uh, I think it's definitely easier to scale that attack piece. You know, like scaling the engineering piece is challenging. And part of it is because you have these um, ideally the, the engineering function and security function would be the same or, or close to a couple. What happens is they're really different communities, and so the you know the engineering community does their part and they hand it over to the security people. So in order to scale, we have to you know first integrate those functions. And then we can work because I think that if, if, as long as you have them separate, the scaling just just further magnifies the problem. I had a question anyway, and it's a it's a I think it's a follow on. The I, in a number of environments, I've heard defense community people talk about the fact that they they need to or should become more like uh, the valley and do rapid innovation and just chuck things and get things moved out more quickly and. I think we've seen in the private sector that that's part of our problem. That's part of our security problem. Is, are the people who are pushing for rapid innovation in the defense community, are they aware that cybersecurity is an issue or is implicated in that? So I think it's safe to say that everyone in the department is aware that cybersecurity is an issue. Um, but the, 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 the rapid prototyping efforts don't quite reflect that concern. You know, it just takes some time for you know, the policy, the system to catch up with what people are concerned about. Um, hopefully we'll get there, but um, it is a trade. And so, you know, the, and we're coming back full circle to engineering and trade spaces. And so oftentimes we're gonna have to, in that trade space, just to know our risk in cybersecurity and, and make systems pretty vulnerable at expenses. Let me check, Scott, any questions up in Indianapolis? Okay. No. Great talk. The last, yeah, Mark. I was wondering if you could provide like a personal experience opinion on how much influence like the Department of Defense has over hardware manufacturers' decisions. Like, for instance, the the meltdown <coughs> vulnerability. Some people started pointing to a uh, paper back in the '90s about how speculative execution was a bad idea. And stuff, and I'm just wondering if, like, the does the defense, you know, department, do they have influence? Do they feel like it's getting away from them? Do they, do they get enough of what they want out of this? Very little influence, generally. Really? Very little. And the reason is, is um, so if you, you know, 30 years ago, when you're looking at, we'll talk about memory technology, right? You know, 30 years ago, um, DOD was probably buying the most, the greatest fraction of memory in the world, and so they had a lot of influence. But today. As, even though it's the largest organization in the world, and you know, I, I spoke to some degree about the scale of DOD, we're just a tiny, tiny fraction of you know a consumer of these types of devices. I mean, just compare DOD to Apple, you know, and 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 they produce more. And so in most cases, we aren't going to have any influence. And so in the early 90s, um, Perry, uh, William Jefferson Perry. No, sorry, I'm conflating things. Perry was the Secretary of Defense in the 90s, and there was what was called the Perry Memo, right? And and this Perry Memo basically said that you know thou shalt buy COPS, which is commercial off the shelf. You have to buy what's off the shelf, and we've done that. And um and and now we're starting to see some of these concerns with commercial electronics, and we're getting away from that. 
we're going more towards designing some of our own things. That's surprising. I, I mean, you know, having grown up in the industry since the 70s, it's like, you know that the Department of Defense had a lot of influence on the computer industry early on. Now, so yeah, so some, so if you so let's talk about you know computer monitors. So if we have a submarine and we need a computer monitor, um, if we go to Dell, we can get a great monitor. You know, by by most definitions, it's a great monitor, hundred bucks, it'll do a great job. But if we have some sort of concern with it, we can we can't influence it at all. If we want a hundred dollar monitor, we can't influence it at all. So there is a niche market of organizations that cater to the defense industry. And so if you want to display, a company like Barco makes an LCD display, and they'll make it however you want to, but it's going to cost $10,000. And when, when people hear of these accounts about, you know, DOD buys a $10,000 computer monitor, it sounds bad, but when you consider that it, how much risk it buys down, how much less you have to test it, how much you have to put into it to make it work in your environment, say to, to survive shock and vibration. And so, so for... In many of these instances, we are we're not using COTS because we just we can't get what we need. I was curious about securing when you're talking about visualizing um, counterfeit hardware and securing it within the supply chain. Is there any research about at what point you inspect that hardware as it moves through fabrication? Or because I guess I'm curious for something like an F-35, there are almost an infinite number of steps that hardware takes before it's assembled and multiple points at which it could be tampered with. Mm -hmm. And at what point do you choose to inspect it? Yeah, great question. So oftentimes um, the problem is, is well, it's, it's a very complex problem. There's many different ways things are counterfeit and there are different levels of scale. And so you can have um, counterfeit raw material, counterfeit silicon that goes to a foundry, or you can have a, a counterfeit Cisco switch. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing is looking at counterfeit microelectronics. So in that case, you're pretty much um, relying on commercial devices. And you don't have any visibility into their process until you have, you know, a chip that you use. And, and that's really the level at which we inspect it. And it's made more difficult because you, um, if you, talking about memory, if you buy memory from Samsung, it's probably going to be legit. It's a very low probability you'll get counterfeit memory from Samsung. But a lot of our systems with these long development times, when we design some sort of system to use some Samsung memory, and by the time it, we actually come to fabricate it, it's not actively being produced. And so we have to go to distributors. And it's that distributor market that's a big problem. And so in any vertical where you have um, equipment that's supported for a long time, infrastructure, um, um, you can I think it's not so much communication, but there are verticals in which you have to support equipment for a very long time, and you really rely heavily on these distributors for parts that are obsolete. And that's where you have the huge counterfeit issues. All right, more well, well, thank you very much for this. And I will thank everybody for coming again, and we we'll hope to see you back here on February 8th for Lori Craner's talk. And until then, hope you're having a good start to the 2018 semester. Thank you all.